this is Eric Topol uh, with Medicine and Machine at Medscape, and I'm really delighted to have uh, Dr. Tom Frieden join today. And we have so much to talk about, so welcome, Tom. It's great to speak with you, Eric. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Well, just for everyone's background, and I think uh, you've been seeing a lot of uh, Dr. Frieden on TV and the media because he was a uh, prior CDC director uh, throughout the Obama administration. And just before we get into things, I want to just, his distinguished background is, is really quite extraordinary. You know, he was at Oberlin for college and then Vanderbilt, Columbia, Yale, where he has both MD, MPH, infectious disease training, and then kind of took over New York City first uh, uh, part of the uh, public health era, then he was the commissioner of New York City. And that's the stepping stone to the CDC, where he uh, was director for eight years. And now he's on to another major campaign in uh, cardiovascular disease with the resolve we'll, we'll talk about. Um, so, Tom, it's actually amazing. You've been preparing for this pandemic throughout your career, I think, right? Well, I think all of us in public health uh, anticipated that there might be a pandemic like this, but we kind of thought it would be influenza. Although over the past decade or more, two decades, it's been clear that it's a mistake to try to predict what the next pandemic is going to be. We didn't think SARS would hit us or MERS or that H1N1 would come from uh, Central America um, or that Ebola would spread in an area of Africa it had never been in before. And what that tells us is one essential thing that we need essentially a pluripotent public health system. We need to be ready for any threat. And that means rapid detection, rapid response. Well, exemplifying that, you oversaw the Ebola response, which was in many ways viewed as a model that averted what could have been a real disaster here in the US. Can you give us your sense about what was different? Obviously it wasn't as um, transmissible, but it was highly deadly. How did, how did it go so well with Ebola, uh, with CDC in the US? Well, there were plenty of ups and downs with Ebola. Uh, the fundamental difference, to be frank, is that Ebola isn't nearly as infectious. Uh, it only spreads through close contact in burial or in hospitals or in families, or rarely through sexual contact. I think that the critical moment in Ebola happened not in the US, not in Guinea, Liberia, or Sierra Leone, but actually in Lagos, Nigeria. Mm. This was during a time in July of 2014 when uh, a person from Liberia who was very sick went to Lagos and died. Uh, that person had been told he had Ebola. He had Ebola, but he didn't tell anyone else. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Lagos, then an outbreak started. And just to give you an idea, Lagos has literally, actually the actual number is it has 10 times more daily flights in and out of Lagos than from Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone combined. Wow. And way more uh, overland traffic as well. So if that outbreak had gotten out of control in Lagos, I believe it would have spread throughout Nigeria and throughout much of Africa, not just for months, but for years. Mm. And for uh, a few days, the response was not good. For a few days, it was disorganized. Um, there were extraneous issues being discussed. And then the polio eradication infrastructure snapped into place to address uh, Ebola in Lagos. And then one patient went to Port Harcourt and started another outbreak in another city of Nigeria. And that infrastructure was amazingly effective at stopping those outbreaks in just a few generations of spread with limited loss of life. And that was the pivotal moment. If that hadn't happened, wow. Ebola might have been spreading for years in Africa. I didn't realize that. That's striking. You know, and while we're on Africa, it's been a positive outlier in the pandemic. Still today, you know, there's very little sign of um, Africa, except as we saw in South Africa with the, the variant B1351. It's held up really well. Um, why do you think that is? Is it because of public health or underreporting, or or is it just yet to come? What's your sense about Africa? I think there are a few different things going on. And I will say that my organization, Resolve to Save Lives, works with more than 20 countries in Africa and has for the last four years on issues of epidemic preparedness. And one thing to say first and foremost is that a lot of these countries are much more familiar with epidemic control than the US is. Mm. 
Mm. When we talk about contact tracing in the US, people said, what is that? When we talk about it in Africa, they say, we got that. And you know, almost immediately, there were thousands of contacts under daily monitoring, really without much effort. They, they've done that for other diseases. But I think there are, are a number of things going on. One, Africa was very proactive with closures. Um, in fact, we uh, um, spearheaded a group called PERC, the Partnership for Evidence-Based Response to COVID in Africa, which did surveys in 28 cities of 20 countries. And what we found was those closures were very painful socially, economically, politically, and health-wise. Uh, this was a situation where actually the cure was worse than the disease. And so with that, the countries modulated and reopened some. So one was a very robust public health response with rapid testing, with border controls and border testing, good contact tracing. So a lot going on uh, that uh, we need to give African public health and medical leaders credit for. Second, it's a much younger population. And as you know, Eric, the, the gradient between young and old in the lethality of this virus is just enormous. Uh, there are countries in Africa where less than 4% of the population is over the age of 60, 65. That compares to 20% plus in, uh, in parts of uh, Europe. So essentially, it's a much less lethal virus, not because the virus is any different, but because the population is different. Third, <clears throat> there is some data that there was a substantial underdiagnosis of death from COVID. Very important study done in Zambia from uh, uh, autopsies found that maybe only one out of 10 patients was diagnosed before death. So the deaths may have been higher than recognized, though not as high as um, they might have been because of the public health measures, because of the age of the population, and because perhaps it's not there yet. And what we're seeing around the world is there's a certain amount of randomness of how explosive spread is. A few super spreader events can create a vicious cycle that just ratchets uh, transmission up in a huge way, which is most likely what's happening in Michigan today. Yeah, it's a really important issue that you're bringing up about the places that become hotspots and those that remain uh, without that type of uh, trend. I want to get back to that. But before we do, you know, we've been communicating throughout the pandemic. And one of my greatest frustrations was the uh, venerable world model CDC that you directed and throughout what I've seen throughout my career, uh, took some hits. And I would send you direct messages saying things would be so different if you were running the CDC. I really believe that. Um, what it must have been, uh, just to get your perception, it was a very tough time with the CDC. Um, weren't you frustrated about this? It was a very tough time. And, and they made a big mistake with the lab test early on. Although really by the third week in February, that mistake was fixed and the lab test was working well. Um, but that was a critical blind spot early in our response. I think you have to look at testing more broadly. Um, the FDA should have allowed private labs to academic labs to begin testing much sooner than they did and much easier than they did. And the Health and Human Services Department should have pulled together all the private uh, testing um, companies, the Quests and Lab Corps of the world, and gotten them very proactively testing, which is what happened in South Korea. So it wasn't just a CDC fumble there, but it was certainly a mistake of CDC. Uh, and it contrasted when H1N1 hit, we developed a, a, a very accurate PCR test within days. We got it approved by the CDC. We sent it out to over 100 countries. We had a million copies right away. So it was stunning to see that kind of a a problem. Uh, really, if you look objectively, how much of a difference that would have made isn't so clear, but it was clearly a black eye and clearly something that shouldn't have happened. We should, we still don't know exactly why it happened. There should be an external investigation and then uh, not to blame anyone, but to make sure it doesn't happen again. But more broadly, Eric, I think the issue was that to respond to uh, an epidemic effectively, you need three things organization, science, and communication. And what we didn't have through all of 2020 was organization, science, and communication. It was never clear who was in charge, who was doing what, no organization, no plan even. Uh, science, we were 
talking about bizarre possible treatments rather than saying, look, we're learning about this every day. And as we learn, we're going to tell you more. Um, a lot of us, myself included, didn't think that masks were be going to be very important back in January and February of 2020. As the data came out, it became clear they're very important. That wasn't because necessarily we were wrong. That's how science works. You learn and you adjust your recommendations. Uh, similarly, we're learning today about the j, &J vaccine and the uh, possibility of uh, blood clots. Um, and then communication. CDC literally wrote the book on how to communicate in a health emergency. Yeah, be yeah. first, be right, be credible. Be <laughs> empathetic, give people practical, concrete, proven things to do. If you think of those five principles, you couldn't possibly have violated them more than the prior administration did. They weren't first, they weren't right, they weren't credible, they weren't empathetic, they didn't give people practical things to do. So of all of the failures of the prior administration, I think you could point to communication as being one of the main ones. In terms of CDC specifically, um, the fact that they weren't allowed to speak directly to the American public, the fact they were doing a lot of great work, but nobody could hear about it. They were stopping outbreaks in nursing homes. They were doing important epidemiologic studies, uh, but it just wasn't being allowed to be told. That was a, a major, major challenge. And of course, for the really hardworking doctors and scientists and others at CDC, it was, I'm sure, demoralizing to be doing uh, important work and then not to be able to make sure that work was being optimally used to protect people's health. Yeah, it actually uh, is amazing to me to think back all the breaches like the censorship of the MMWR and uh, the fact that the director didn't stand up um, to the administration when it, when the whole organization was subjugated. And uh, it's, a, it's an extraordinary uh, time, uh, hopefully uh, one will never see again, because I, I know you would never have tolerated that uh, under your leadership. Now, um, vaccines. Uh, you obviously um, been involved with lots of vaccines over your career. And this one seemed like, you know, pulling a, a rabbit out of a hat. I mean, we had uh, basically existential threat to the species here. And then, you know, within a matter of months, like 10 months, we go from the identification of the pathogen sequence to big trials. Um, can you put that in perspective? Because there's actually people who think that it happened too fast that it, there's something wrong with the vaccine. Can, can you help us on that one? It is a stunning success story of science. And Eric, I've seen your, your pinned timeline of this, and it is one of the remarkable stories uh, in all of history. But one thing that's really important to emphasize, and this is something that um, health professionals can explain to patients, this was not rushed in the sense that we're cutting corners on safety. And it didn't spring magically out in a year. We're talking about decades of research yeah. on mRNA and vectors, and then buckets of money being put into this saying money is no object. Uh, we're gonna bet on multiple horses and see which succeed. And that really has clearly been very important. And then we got lucky in a few ways. One way we got lucky is that uh, mother nature does a pretty good job here. So our own immune system is pretty good. After COVID, maybe 94% protection against serious illness for at least eight months. That's impressive. And if you take a disease like malaria or TB or HIV, mother nature doesn't do very well against the pathogen and we still don't have a vaccine. But if the body can make a good defense, then we have a much better chance of doing it with the vaccine. So we got lucky with the technology. We got lucky with our immune system. Uh, but I don't think anyone suggested, thought that we would have 90, 95% protection um, or maybe close to 100% protection against severe disease. I haven't heard of anyone who's been fully vaccinated and has died from COVID. And more than 100 million people have been vaccinated in the US. So th this is a remarkably effective vaccine. And the mRNA technology, I think, is a game changer. It may be able to be used for other vaccines, for biologicals, for other things. So it's really exciting as a, a technology that's coming out of this pandemic. But the, the data on safety is really important for people to understand. As you know better than I, the clinical trials for these vaccines were larger than usual. Over 100,000 patients participated. There were no serious adverse 
events. And yes, you may see when millions or tens or hundreds of millions of people are vaccinated, you may see rare serious adverse events, but it went so fast because we cut red tape, not because we cut corners on safety. Yeah, well, you know, you framed a lot there that I think just deserves emphasis. Number one, that the natural infections engender such, you know, strong immunity, which may go on for years, as you say, at least eight months or so. And that is uh, different from these other uh, pathogens, whether it be influenza, HIV, TB, et cetera. Uh, that's important. And it's directed to the spike protein. Uh, which is interesting because uh, as, a, as a primary clone of antibodies, but the, the vaccine is even better than the natural infection because you get even you know, stronger titers and broader antibody neutralizing activity. So it's actually, as you say, we're lucky. Now, um, the, today was the day when J&J &J had the six cases, all women, all young, between 18 and 48. And um, with this cerebral uh, uh, venous thrombosis, also known as CVST for cavernous sinus um, thrombosis. Now, only one of these cases of J&J &J was during the clinical trial, as it turns out. It was a 21-year-old man, actually, and they stopped the trial uh, in October very briefly to review that case. Um, so now we have seven cases out of somewhere around 7 million J and J vaccines that were administered, one in a million. Maybe it's a little different than one in a million because maybe not every one of these CVSTs have been um, uh, fully documented. But um, you you touched on that already, and I want to get a further um, perspective. That is, you do a clinical trial, you have a hundred thousand people, then you put it into there's over eight hundred million doses of vaccines in one hundred and fifty four countries in hundreds of millions of people. We know there's going to be some things that we won't anticipate, right? Absolutely. Um, I, I am concerned, though, because uh, a very serious adverse event, even if it's only one in a million, is something that needs to be looked at carefully. And uh, even before this, I was really a fan of the mRNA vaccines. They're easier to tweak in case there are variants. They're less susceptible to production delays. And you've seen production problems with both AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson. It's a biological process. You're growing something. In contrast, the mRNA is basically a chemical process. Mm. And so it's much more predictable. And in terms of ramping up global manufacturing, the, the time to actually start is much faster with the mRNA vaccines. You can perhaps start in as soon as six to nine months. And right now, we are not on track to vaccinate the world until 2023. So there's a real need to increase manufacturing capacity. And I think of the mRNA vaccines as an insurance policy, an insurance against variants, an insurance against production failure, and now maybe an insurance against rare and serious side effects. But as you know well, you have to put it in perspective. One in a million vaccinees may be getting a serious adverse event versus about one in 200 people with COVID infection dying from it. Uh, that's a very large order of magnitude difference, um, especially in places where COVID is spreading a lot. And so it's always going to be a risk benefit ratio and we need to learn more. Maybe we can identify risk factors in people that predispose, whether it was medicines or other things that predispose to an adverse event. Maybe we can identify early detection and treatment with immunoglobulins or other things that could improve the outcomes uh, and get the serious adverse event down to one in 10 million. So you're, you're going to see things like this. This is, as I've been saying for many months, this is the most complicated vaccination program in US history. And it's going to be the most complicated in global history as well. Right. No, that, this is really important because uh, you're touching on the mRNA. There hasn't been a CVST case yet with the mRNA, which is really interesting. There have been some cases of uh, the platelet drop, but none of this most dreaded type of, of rare, exceedingly rare blood clot. So, you know, that is surprising. Maybe we'll see it. But so far, you know, as you've already mentioned, there's been a lot of mRNA vaccines and uh, it seems to be so far exempt from this uh, dreaded, exceedingly rare 
uh, a fact. Medicine and the Machine will be right back. Welcome to Medscape's latest podcast series, Medicine and the Machine, featuring Medscape's Editor-in-Chief, Dr. Eric Topol, and Master Storyteller and Clinician, Dr. Abraham Verghese. Remember, you can find the latest in medical news, expert perspectives, clinical tools, continuing medical education, and more at Medscape.com. Now, we already, um, you already mentioned about Michigan, and I want to get your readout on the current state of the pandemic, because a lot of people were thinking it's over, and then we started seeing B117 come into the country. And uh, certainly Michigan has to turn out to be the bellwether. Uh, And the cases have been rising, hospitalizations have been spiking. Uh, We're seeing also neighboring states like Minnesota and uh, Illinois uh, starting to show the same trend. Um, What are your thoughts about where we're headed now? Well, one thing I have to say, just stepping back, I feel like we don't learn. You know, when, when COVID first hit Italy, it was as if people are, well, it's not going to come here. And when B117 hit the UK, it was like, it's not going to come here. So I understand people are really tired. There's pandemic fatigue. And we've learned a lot. We've learned that schools can be open safely with precaution. We've learned that outdoors is generally fine. So there's a lot we can do. Uh, but certain things are really risky. Church choirs, bars, restaurants. Um, these are things that I I just wish we would wait a little longer for because we will have strong vaccine-induced population immunity plus natural immunity within the next couple of months, but we don't have it yet. And uh, we have this confluence of circumstances where we've now vaccinated so many seniors and almost universally in nursing homes so that uh, we really have a drastically lower risk of death from COVID. Um, And so the hospitals are now seeing people in their 40s and 50s because people in their 60s and 70s have been vaccinated. So they're not coming in. So the vaccine effect is major. And we have to uh, really factor that into our decisions and discussions about what gets closed. We shouldn't factor that into discussions about masking. There's no economic harm to masking. The only freedom a mask inhibits is the freedom of the virus to spread and kill people. So I, I don't have any sympathy with the, the, the kind of freedom from masks. You don't have a right to walk into a grocery store and infect someone with a virus that's going to kill them when you could just wear a mask and prevent that from happening. But I, I do think we need to balance reopening with safety. And we have to understand that for the places that are having cases explode today, vaccination is not going to tamp it down. Masks and closures are going to tamp it down. Vaccination is going to take two to six weeks after vaccine. But there is a bigger issue with vaccine that I think transcends the issue of Michigan or the uh, upper Midwest. And that is aiming our shots better. We're not doing a great job aiming our shots well. We've done well with seniors generally. But if you look at a micro level as an epidemiologist, I look in communities and sometimes I see that the places with the highest vaccination rates have the lowest disease rates and not because they're preventing disease with vaccine, but because they're rich folks. And the cases in contrast with the highest case rates have the lowest vaccine rates. And that's because they're poor, disenfranchised, not well served. Um, First come first serve is a terrible formula for equity. And this isn't just bad for an ethical reason, though it's morally Um, unacceptable. It's bad for an epidemiological reason. If you vaccinate someone in a high-risk community, in a high-risk group, you may well stop transmission and save lives. If you vaccinate someone who's teleworking and healthy, middle-aged person, you're probably not going to prevent any cases and any deaths. So not every vaccine has the same value. We have to do better aiming our shots where they'll do the most good. Well, that is that can't be emphasized enough. That is, you know, the people who come for the vaccine site are the ones who are cautious. You know, they they're generally the ones who get it. And the ones who don't show up or don't make an appointment or can't make an appointment, they're the ones who need it the most. And that's unfortunate. Now, 
I, one thing I don't know, I, in recent days, you know, some of the leading experts like yourself have said, well, we should really rely in Michigan on, um, uh, you know, mitigation, just, you know, closing the things that had been open uh, too quickly. But I also think we learned from the Israel and the UK experience, now that Israel is fully open, that loading up vaccines aggressively helped them get reopened. And we already know, as you've already emphasized, you know, we have severe fatigue with this thing and people just want to open. So it seems like, you know, in Michigan as a precedent, now we're going to see it in Minnesota, perhaps, um, if we just do both mitigation and, as you say, get the vaccinations to the right people, get as many first shots perhaps as we can, uh, you know, just aggressive, um, not like, um, you know, it's, it's a, a nine to five thing, but rather like you've emphasized in your posts about getting in them in doctor's offices and getting them, you know, mobile and all the other ways that we can get shots uh, administered. So um, I'm hoping that, you know, when we have these challenges that we'll, we'll, we'll rely on not just mitigation. We've already seen how that doesn't work in some places and that we also can you know, you know, get both of these. We didn't have vaccinations for the first few waves here and we have it now. Um, and if, I, you know, that's something I, I know Rochelle yesterday, or Walensky at CDC, who I have great respect for, she basically said, we can just go ahead with mitigation. I, I don't know about that. I think we can do both. One of the big challenges for the federal government is what do they do um, in terms of perverse incentives? If you move vaccine from places that are doing well to places doing poorly, then a month from now, when the places that were doing well get hit, they said, you know, we wouldn't be getting hit if you'd left us with our vaccine. So I think they, they legitimately have a, a challenge in terms of equity with vaccine administration. But I think the way out of this is to reverse what Julian Tudor Hart wrote decades ago in The Lancet, the inverse care law. Uh, Hart wrote that the availability of good medical care tends to vary inversely with the need for it in the population served. And we are really seeing that across the US, not in all communities, but in many. So if we can aim our shots better, um, make sure, for example, you could say, if you're in a zip code that has a rate above X, you can walk in for a vaccine. You don't need an appointment. And we're going to set up 18 hour shifts, six hours a day, six days a week. And if all of the people from that community and send community workers out, community organizations out, community leaders out and say, come on, get vaccinated, then you're aiming your shots better. I did a simple calculation that a well-aimed shot can save 10 times as many lives and prevent a hundred times as many cases as a poorly aimed shot. And this isn't necessarily about moving shots uh, between states, but how we're focusing them within communities. And this is the level at which it's great to be focusing on 2 million, 3 million, 4 million vaccinations a day. And that does an enormous amount of good building up our population immunity. But we also have to think of how are we aiming those shots? Yeah, no, I think your point is, is that you're highlighting this is critical. And I think that's been missed along the way with just numbers. And I also think that, um, you know, this whole idea of uh, getting um, vaccinations, the challenge as you're getting to uh, where it's most needed. We, we've not really cracked that case throughout the country if you look at who is getting the vaccine. Now, uh, before moving on to the next topic, this thing about Michigan versus Florida or Texas, places that just kind of been wide open or you just abandoned the idea of mitigation totally. And we don't see you know, these uh, outbreaks there. Uh, is that going back to your point earlier regarding these super spreader events that just happened? Are there any other explanations you have to understand this, this discrepancy? We really don't know for sure. Uh, one thing is there's a lot more outdoor activity in the South than there is in the North. It's warmer there. And uh, being outdoors is hugely important. Ventilation is important and outdoors is the best ventilation imaginable pretty much. So that, that is one variable that may be driving it. Um, it may be bad luck with uh, super spreader events. You've seen some documentation of single clusters spreading all over the country. Um, it may be a question of time. I hope Florida continues to do well, but it's possible that they will start getting hit hard in a few weeks. We just don't know. 
Uh, but I think this is one of the unanswered questions of this pandemic. And uh, there are others. We have a lot to learn still. Well, and apropos to that, we saw some countries in Europe that didn't have as nearly a big a problem with the same variant that we're dealing with right now, the UK B117. And others had, you know, just a horrendous uh, uh, state uh, well, that they went through for months. And also, if you look at India, it's very puzzling. They had a, a, a lockdown that didn't go so well, but they did crush the curve. There was very little COVID. And then it came roaring back. So why did it go away? Why did it come back? Sometimes these are stochastic events. Right. Uh, they occur and... Um, it may be a, a matter of being in the wrong place at the wrong time, or if you're the virus, uh, you consider being in the right place at the right time. Yeah, very opportunistic enemy that we have for sure, and mysterious in some regards. That, as you say, we haven't understood a lot of aspects of how it operates, uh, even this 15, 18 months later. Um, one thing I wanted to call out is your ability to communicate. And you mentioned that as one of the three pillars of a CDC and you're still doing it, even though you're not the CDC director. Every Friday, you would put out a Twitter uh, thread, oftentimes with many, many, 20, 30 posts connected. This had to take hours for you to do. This wasn't a great public service that you did, that you weren't required to do, you just did it. And you, I could just see you toiling away on a Friday evening, putting all this together. Can you tell us about that? It, it started in January of 2020. There were six important articles that had come out that week. And um, I, I'm not running the CDC anymore. So I had time to read them very carefully. And uh, I thought, well, let me summarize these for folks. It's Friday night, you know, a, have a single glass of wine and 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 write a, a summary of these uh, these six articles. And I got so much feedback from people, including people in the government, who said we don't have time to read them carefully. Thank you for that. And then, um, as it became less possible for CDC to say what was happening, I thought, well, you know, if I were at CDC, this is what I would be emphasizing for this week. Um, and then it became an issue of it's so hard to keep up. The developments in science and epidemiology and control were so rapid that in the course of any one week, there was a lot of epidemiologic news. And sometimes some of the commentary by very well-meaning people didn't really get it right in terms of uh, having a disease control perspective, understanding what's really important, what can make a difference, uh, what's a flashy headline versus what's really big news. And so it became a, a pattern. Um, I've recently tried to stop doing it, but each, each week it gets really uh, know, lots noticed, of new things happening. I noticed I, feel I posted, this was your last one, and then you did another one the following week. I said, okay, but it's, it's actually, I just can't uh, you know, give you enough kudos for that. All of us that are following the pandemic closely, Tom, that, that takes a lot of work, uh, it really does. Now, um, once you're the CDC director for eight years in, a, in an Obama administration, it must be hard to find the next walk of your career, the next arc, I should say, and you did it. So can you tell us about uh, what you're doing now and what you have been doing since you started Resolve? Well, I was very fortunate. Um, I knew that I would leave after eight years. The, the last person to last eight years at CDC was Dave Sensor, and, and he was appointed in 1966. So eight years is enough. Uh, regardless of what had happened with the election uh, in 2016. And uh, I was able to um, think big picture about what are the areas that are truly on the bubble where um, a non-governmental organization correctly positioned, generously funded by some donors could make a huge difference. And uh, I identified two broad areas. One is epidemic readiness. We realized after Ebola that the world was far too vulnerable. And uh, a lot of progress was made um, identifying what needed to be done, but not a lot of progress getting it done. So one of our areas was uh, closing the epidemic preparedness gaps. Um, and the second was cardiovascular health, something near and dear to you as well. Uh, as you know, cardiovascular disease is the world's number one killer. And we identified within cardiovascular disease three things, the global elimination of trans fat, a reduction in sodium consumption, 
and the control of hypertension. Those three things done correctly could prevent 100 million deaths over a 30 year period. And with funding from generous donors, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Bloomberg Philanthropies, and more recently, the Start Small Foundation, uh, we've been able to ramp up activities in both areas that have really exceeded very ambitious goals. So in the epidemic preparedness space, uh, we're working in dozens of countries and we're seeing substantial progress with countries able to find and stop outbreaks in hours to days where it used to be weeks to months. Countries that have tracking systems, surveillance systems, laboratory networks that they didn't before. Resources in the tens of billions of dollars being spent on strengthening preparedness that weren't there before. And with COVID, the potential to really make the world drastically safer from future pandemic threats. And in terms of the cardiovascular work, we have really a domino effect with the world becoming free of artificial trans fat. India just took action to become trans fat free with best practice options. Um, trans fat elimination alone will save more than 17 million lives over 25 years. And we're seeing it expand. Hypertension treatment, turns out you can really do hypertension treatment well. Globally, we control maybe 10 or 15% of the uh, blood pressure of people with hypertension. And yet the medications don't have to cost on an international market more than $10 a year. And the protocol driven care can be done very effectively at, at high rates. And this comes from the experience with tuberculosis and HIV. We know that protocol driven care does really well for the vast number of people. For complicated patients, you can do something else. But uh, these are winnable battles. These are areas where we can make a huge difference. So I'm, I feel very fortunate that we have this opportunity and uh, some initial funding uh, to do this. We're now entering into our second five year period. Wow. and uh, thinking of what to do next in these and other areas. But it's been, a, it's been really a, a lot of fun and a great privilege. And it's great to work with so many terrific people around the world on something that can make such a difference in so many people's lives. Well, let me just say, we're the ones who are fortunate, uh, Tom, uh, for you to do this, to have this planetary big, uh, big thinking, big action. And, uh, you know, it's extraordinary. You know, so many people might have thought you would have your peak impact for eight years as CDC director and stamping out a major outbreaks around the world. And here, look what you're doing. It's really, really extraordinary. So congratulations on that. We'll be following resolve and your resolve uh, to, to uh, make the world a healthier place for people. And thanks so much for joining us today. Well, thank you, Eric. And thanks for what you do. You've been a model uh, on Twitter and in communications uh, and your work with Medscape and others. So it's really a great pleasure to speak with you.